Welcome uh, to the first of our seminars, um, our autumn series. Um, I'm Rebecca Rumble, I'm Head of Research at my Society. Um, and we are putting these seminars on um, as a way of kind of keeping in touch with our global Tic Tac community um, and to kind of talk about some of the things that we've been thinking about during the pandemic, um, some of the work that we've been doing and what we've been hearing uh, throughout our community um, about what's important, what's interesting and what's new. Um, so we thought it was quite timely to get people together after hopefully some of you might have had a summer break, <laughs> maybe not, I don't know. Um, but yeah, good, a good point uh, to start thinking about data uh, and openness and transparency, I think, as we're going into uh, the winter months in Europe, at least. So thank you very much for joining. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, just as a quick fun introduction, um, Gemma's going to throw a little poll up. It'd be interesting to know where people are joining us from today. So if you wouldn't mind letting us know, that would be great. Okay, thanks very much. So that's uh, that's pretty interesting. We've got a, a decent spread. Obviously, most of our most of our people are here from Europe, but we've got some early risers in North and South America, um, and some people working a little bit late in Asia. So welcome, welcome to everyone. Um, and an interesting spread amongst public sector, private sector, civil society, um, and academia. So again, a great. A great mix as we love to have um, at our Tic Tech, uh, Tic Tech events. So thank you very much for sharing that information with us. Um, so just to um, go through a couple of housekeeping uh, points, um, this is being recorded. Um, please do ask questions in the chat. Um, we'll be monitoring those so that we can pose them to, to our panellists. Um, it'd be great if you want to tweet to talk more about the conversation. Um, if you use the hashtag TicTac, um, that'd be great. We can, uh, we can keep uh, monitoring that and sharing it on our feeds. We have a collaborative notes document. So if you would like to take part in some of the note taking, if there's some really kind of powerful sentiments or, or statements, um, that you think we, we should keep abreast of, then we can record them there. Um, and finally, later on, there is a networking session. Um, if you have signed up for that, Mark and Gemma, my colleagues, will be running that straight after the discussion using the Zoom breakout rooms. So uh, you will get further instructions on that towards the end of the seminar. Um, finally, don't forget to fill in our Tic Tech survey. Um, we'll share the link in the chat. Um, it'd be great in terms of our planning um, to know what people find useful, what people might want to talk to uh, talk about in future, and indeed how we might want to run these kinds of events in future, uh, especially given various different restrictions uh, that are being imposed globally on travel and meeting up and such things. So please do uh, let us know through that survey. It's, it's immensely helpful for us in terms of trying to put events on that are useful for, for you guys as well as us. So um, without further ado, um, I'd love to introduce you to our panellists. I'm very, very grateful um, to the three of them for, for agreeing to join and, and take part in the conversation today. So we have uh, Fabrizio Scrolini, um, who is Executive Director um, at Open Data Latin American Initiative in Uruguay. We have Carabo Rajuli, who is Country Manager for Open Ownership in South Africa. Um, we have Olivier Thoreau, um, who is Head of Research and Development at the Open Data Institute in the UK. So a really great spread of experts um, to, to take forward this discussion today. So thank you all for joining us. Um, right, so we may as well dive straight in. I am basically here just to ask these interesting people, interesting questions. As I say, I've got a few lined up, but please do uh, use the, the chat bar to ask your own questions and we will monitor that and, and pose them to the panel as well. Um, it'd be great if each of our panelists maybe could give, you know, a very brief kind of introduction um, and, and a little bit about their roles and their interests. Um, and yeah, please enjoy. So um, Fabrizio, would you, would you like to kick us off? My pleasure. Thank you very much for this kind invitation and, and welcome 
everybody. Uh, yes, I, I lead the Latin American Open Data Initiative, ILDA, where we explore the use of open data and data more generally for development. And we do this in several ways, through research, through helping to develop prototypes and through uh, community building and engaging. And at the moment, um, you know, Latin America seems to be like the worst um, region uh, uh, affected by, by the COVID or the one with most cases. Um, so so it's, a, it's a very uh, particular hot spot to be. Um, spring is coming to this territory, so who knows, maybe we might, uh, we might be a spare, um, uh, but, uh, or, or cases could, could go down. But, but that's, um, that's part of the problem we are having now. Uh, and if you want, I can quickly jump in into the problem we face, which is data. Uh, and um, at the moment, uh, our governments, depending on where you sit uh, or where you live, are um, issuing several decrees and uh, measures some of them quite restrictive of personal freedoms and of several um, civic liberties that uh, are justified uh, because of the pandemic and because of the data about the pandemic. Now, the nature of this data, the way this data is compiled, the way this data is shared and the transparency about this data and if you want the metadata about it um, varies, um, varies greatly across Latin America. Uh, and as a result, um, this is a problem, not only for the management of the pandemic itself, but for the lasting consequences that this could have in these countries. Um, just to give you a bit of context, uh, the continent has several, um, um, I would say, degrees or various varieties of democratic regime. It's largely a democratic continent, but with several challenges in this front. And this disruption uh, is affecting elections, is affecting uh, schools, is affecting several um, key uh, institutions. Uh, and as a result, um, we still don't know how this might unfold or the long lasting effect of these uh, measures. Um, so I think I, as a way of an introduction, I, I will leave it there. Um, so basically, telling you I live in the worst spot for this <laughs> today. Um, unfortunately, Uruguay is not the case, but, yet, but yes, for, for the region. Um, and, and we do worry that the nature in which data is being used could not be the best in terms of uh, justifying the measures we are now seeing from several governments across the region. Thank you, Fabrizio. Um, Caraba, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? I think she might be frozen. <laughs> okay, I think we're having a few technical difficulties. Uh, Carabo, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll come back to uh, come back to you, um, Olivier. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, with. My most sincere apologies, the, the perils of working at home means that I've had a, a fire alarm ringing for the past five minutes and it's still ringing. I am told it's a test um, and, I, and, I, and I've been joking in every uh, remote event that there's no such thing as a, that old discussion about here are the fire exits and there's no fire alarm planned for today. But for once, there you go, there is a fire alarm. It stopped for a minute, so I'll, I'll introduce myself and hope that it, the, the noise is not too annoying. So my my name is Olivia Thoreau. I'm the um, head of R&D at the Open Data Institute. Uh, as uh, as Becca uh, said earlier, we're um, we're based in the UK. We're a global nonprofit uh, looking at uh, the uh, ecosystem of data sharing and open data. We we're working towards a, a world where people uh, can access and use data to make better decisions. And a pandemic like uh, COVID has been a, a really a stress test for the kind of data ecosystems and data infrastructure. Um, it, I've been leading a, a piece of work with my team on that, looking at well, helping people. Sorry about the noise. Uh, helping people and researching the practices. And for me. Um, 
from perhaps a, a, a perspective, uh, you know, slightly um, contrasted from what Fabrizio was saying in that I'm, I'm looking mostly at, at what's been done in, in, in fairly democratic countries. But the, the stress test for me is that a public health emergency like COVID is a case where the myth of uh, having a few big brains in a central department in a government that are looking at data and making policy decisions and communicating policy decisions doesn't work anymore. You need as many experts to see the evidence. You need help of, to, of and as many people as possible to help you make those right decisions. So that already you, you have a need for that data to be more, um, more broadly shared. But more importantly, what we're seeing in, uh, in all the, the policy decisions decisions um, around COVID is that the decisions need to be made at national levels, at local levels, at regional levels, and also at international levels. We've been, we've been helping uh, uh, um, some data policy with the WHO. And one of the things that I, we saw fairly early on is that while governments were doing some efforts, well, some governments anyway, doing, uh, making some efforts of publishing some data, the data was completely different from, from point to point. And so uh, to, to me, uh, you know, trying to see the silver lining in this pandemic, this has been a really good case for us to understand how data can make things better in, uh, in getting people to understand a problem very quickly, to collaborate quickly and to communicate through a mix of, you know, the, the usual communication means, but also with the evidence, also with the data as, as a way to get uh, a, a deeper and and a deeper understanding of the dis of the the logic behind the decisions and therefore more by in or or more pushback but uh, informed pushback from from the population um, the the other point that might be interesting to to talk about today depending on where the um, the interest lies is that uh, it's been a case where, unlike usual, open data and shared data has been not just the uh, prerogative of governments. There's been many, many more actors um, uh, publishing, making available data, and many, a, a much richer ecosystem of organization, researchers, uh, companies publishing and using data, and, and much less of that usual dichotomy of government publishes and civil society uh, explores and, and, and prods at the data. It's much richer, and that to me may be a picture of the future. Thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, Gemma, do you know if we have Karaba back yet? We've lost her, unfortunately. Um, so I would advise carrying okay. on as we get her back. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll soldier on and hopefully once she rejoins, um, we, can, uh, we can give her the floor as well. Uh, great, so thank you very much Fabrizio and Olivier. Um, some really great points to kick us off there. I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation today is because I think quite a lot of us in, especially the open data community, um, have been saying for years, um, we, you know, we just need to do better at open data. There's no reason why we shouldn't do it. Surely it's going to be helpful for all kinds of policy making decisions. Um, and it's, it's always felt like less of a priority. Um, obviously, you know, six, seven months ago, we found ourselves globally in a situation where actually what we've been saying for an awfully long time about having better quality and more open data um, might have helped in, in a number of different ways in tackling the pandemic. So we, I, think, I think maybe some other people in the community like myself feel a bit like, I, I think we told you so <laughs> to some governments at the moment. Um, you know, especially since global supply chains are global, they are, they are global. It's not just about what information we have here in the UK or in the US, um, but, but the access of that information to, to everyone around the world to know how to efficiently procure and, and examine um, beneficial ownership and, and the transparency of, of all of these kinds of concerns. Um, so yeah, we're hoping that this will be a really positive conversation to kind of demonstrate exactly how useful some of these things that we maybe have been saying for years really are, and that we should be focusing on them in future. Again, we're seeing a lot of a lot of kind of knee-jerk reactions, I think, at the moment, especially in the funding community, towards okay, we're pivoting everything towards COVID recovery, um, which is great. And yes, there are certain things that that 
really need attention um, in terms of uh, the economic and social and, and health recovery. But again, actually turning to this data issue um, and saying, well, actually, we need to kind of double down on some of the things that we have been kind of chipping away at, um, I think might be really useful. So uh, we've got Carabo back. Um, <laughs> do you want to introduce yourself? Brilliant. That, thanks, Rebecca. I don't generally leave meetings as I'm about to speak. <laughs> the difference of online meetings. So yeah, my, my name is Karabo Rajuli and I'm based in South Africa in Cape Town. And I am a country manager at Open Ownership, which is a global initiative supporting countries move from commitment to implementation of their beneficial ownership transparency commitments. There are over 90 countries who have now got some degree of commitment to beneficial ownership transparency globally and open ownership is providing support to about 40 countries globally. So that's in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, in Uruguay, as well as Europe and Southeast Asia. So we cover quite a broad range of countries in a broad range of contexts um, and, and data, data challenges as well as opportunities and how data can be used to address some of the the challenges um, and the variety of them, which arise from lack of having uh, transparency around the true owners of companies. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, right. Um, I am going to uh, kick off asking you some questions. Uh, as I say, everyone listening in, please contribute your own questions in the sidebar. We will hopefully try and get to as many as possible. Um, and just to kick off, I suppose in open and accessible data terms, um, what, if any, changes um, do you think has COVID-19 catalyzed? You know, does the crisis represent a watershed moment in how governments and policy stakeholders think about and do open data? Or is that, um, is that not actually the case, do we think? Um, Carabo, would you like to step in first? Hmm. So I think I prefer the term rather than say watershed. I think what we have seen certainly from a beneficial ownership adoption angle is an acceleration of how this particular type of data is understood as a way in which to address other social, political, economic problems that countries are trying to resolve. And so there's been a, a large amount of advocacy and awareness of the importance of having reliable, accurate, and readily available access to beneficial ownership data from a range of countries. What COVID-19 has done is really situate those advocacy type objectives within actual real world challenges. And so examples of that would be um, where we have seen countries grappling with lack of um, due diligence around procurement arrangements, certainly in, in, in a range of countries where I particularly offer support, there's been a number of corruption scandals around public procurement, and there the absence of having data around true ownership has been a limitation in the manner in which governments or law enforcement is able then to address some of these either conflicts of interest which have arisen or um, the conflicts of interest which have involved politically exposed persons. What you're also seeing very interestingly is a demand side from private sector for beneficial ownership data. So because of the, I suppose, the limitation in economic resources which are now available, there's a much stronger desire from public private sector users to be able to do much more um, robust due diligence checks before making investment type decisions. The, the, the other aspect of this is that as you've seen many countries and many governments wanting to offer some kind of relief or, or support to SMEs who are often the backbone of many economies, having some kind of check to ensure that the SMEs which are being supported, which are getting access to a limited an amount of funds, has been by, it's been important to be able to have some kind of data to verify whether or not the SME who is claiming to be an SME is indeed an SME and not linked to other sort of larger, larger corporate structures. And so what COVID-19 has done, I think, is really embed the idea of actually it really matters to be able to have this data. And it's not just about having this data, but it's about having accurate and reliable and readily accessible data, which is also in a structured format. Yeah, really kind of good use case. Okay, this is not just nice to have, this is really, really important. Um, Olivier, there was a lot of vigorous 
uh, agreement, I think, <laughs> I saw from your end. <laughs> yes, a lot of nodding. I mean, Carabo really put it really well that that, that uh, the, the pandemic really showed the need for you know accurate, reliable, structured data, very much so. And that's something that, to me, um, has been um, if I don't know if watershed is the right word, but definitely a a big penny drop moment uh, in that until now we hadn't had, as far as I can tell anyway, uh, that much of an understanding that open data is something that can be used to help with a crisis. And therefore, if you if all you're doing with open data is transparency about how your day to day uh, um, uh, going ons of your government, then you then it's then you don't really necessarily understand the need to build the infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I don't mean just a technical infrastructure. I mean everything from the communities you work with, the people, the roles, the standards, the uh, the and the technologies, of course, as well. But the the big deer in the headlight moment with government saying we need to we need to make this data available quickly uh, was completely um, at first uh, inadequate in that you've seen the, the 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 governments that did decide early on that open data was a way for them to work on this uh, openly and transparently most of them what they did was to uh, create dashboards, which, you know, they're nice, they're pretty, but they're not actually use, useful and usable. And I get back to what Carabo was saying, data that is accurate, reliable, uh, structured, findable, all those qualities can only be achieved, especially in an, in, in an emergency where you don't have the ability to just start from, 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 well, you have to start from scratch, but you need, you need that the infrastructure in place. And so for me, the one thing that hopefully will have really got into people's heads is that you need the infrastructure so that when the challenge arises, you're ready for it and you, you can then build on that, build that data um, ecosystem quickly and efficiently. Otherwise, you just scramble for months while, while the crisis hurts. Thanks. And Fabrizio, you, you talked a little bit uh, about there being, you know, a few, a few gaps that this has highlighted, that there's certain limitations on, you know, the data that has been collected, it can only go so far, and then people are coming up against a bit of a barrier. Um, do you want to kind of, do you want to talk us through a bit that? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly echo um, what my colleagues uh, have been saying, but I'm a little bit cautious about government um, embracing open data. Um, governments might be embracing data because they need it now. Uh, where are my hospitals? I don't have a decent open street map uh, to actually show me where my hospitals are because the coordinates were never put into. So there's people actually collecting data on where hospitals are across the world. Um, you know, and, and so on. But many layers of uh, basic data that you need to make decisions were not there. And some governments are now um, curious about how to get that, let alone the fact that they need to set up these dashboards just to contain public opinion that has been wildly speculating about this virus. And, and you are probably very familiar with uh, misinformation and other phenomena that has been around for a while. So as a result, um, you know, data is important. How the governments handle this is different. Um, so in some countries, we have seen in Latin America, a very open approach, uh, not only putting all the data available, but the metadata itself through open data portals and trying to engage, uh, you know, the public and trying to engage the media about the limits of the data and what they could actually extract from it and what could them and trying to improve that. Um, so we have seen some governments actually actively engaging and doing that, particularly at a local level or uh, at a city level, um, but also a few national governments as well. And also we say we have seen governments more uh, cautious about how they share good quality data for basically security reasons or for, um, for actually for the, the, if you say this uh, argument that you don't shout fire in a crowded theater, which is one of the um, traditional arguments where people coming from the access to information or freedom of information uh, communities will already hear before. Um, and that said, I, I find the argument, you, you can say this is reasonable up to some point, but in a context where governments are unable to uh, influence, uh, 
you know, all these information campaigns that got around this virus and, and the illnesses and so on, maybe they will need to say something anyway, because other people are actually saying things for them. So, you know, the voice of governments is, is very, um, it's very important. Uh, so I, I say that to some degree, uh, the data agenda has been vindicated. In some cases, the open data agenda has been vindicated as well. So we do have a moment of, we told you so, and we have been telling this for the last 10 years or so. That was nice for me for the last, uh, for the first five minutes, I guess. The other, fi the other five minutes was nice for the epidemiologist and all the people who've been working on the spread of virus around the world that say, you know, we haven't been saying this for the last 10 years or 15 years at least. Um, so for all these people, I think this is a great moment as well for the open science advocates who are now um, getting, um, you know, ways of comparing uh, uh, the databases and the studies that are published. Uh, and this, in some few cases in Latin America, we are getting to see um, very good uh, uh, groups of advisors providing up-to-date information to governments uh, to actually make sense of protocols and other measures uh, that, that, are, that are only possible uh, because, you know, the open science movement actually managed to uh, prevail in this context. So how long are we going to remember this? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I think that we are now getting to see uh, the data is important. The governments are, are coming to terms with that. The development of uh, an app, uh, regardless if it is, you know, developed by Apple and Google or national governments uh, to do the contact tracing process, which is in itself a powerful discussion or a very complex discussion, um, also, you know, reminds us of the complexity of the data where we are facing. Whether that world is going to be open or not, well, I think that's up for the grabs at the moment. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, quite interesting to, to kind of think about, okay, well, now we have managed to demonstrate that there is massive value um, to, to good data, to open data, but yeah, government memories um, are often not so long. Um, so I suppose one of the things that would be good to, to hear from you guys is how you see what barriers there are to, to getting government to not only admit and say, okay, yep, this is important, but invest in doing it better um, and how to kind of keep this momentum going so that it's not just a very kind of fleeting uh, acknowledgement and then it's kind of deprioritized again. How do we kind of keep good open data uh, on the agenda? Um, uh, Carabo, do you want to come in on that? Um, I may have missed part of your question, but but from what I yeah, the, the gist of what I just got was how do you maintain momentum for the, the, these open data initiatives which have been adopted rather rapidly during the last during, during this current period before i hop into that i want to tie into a bit of what uh, tie into some some was raised just now on the context of why open data policies or initiatives are adopted by by governments and what we have seen at open ownership and and Guys, our approach is saying that data is one aspect of a set of decisions and commitments which need to be made by, by national governments. And so we don't just look to say, get it online and the solutions will be found. It's about saying what needs to sustainably change along a, a long sort of an implementation cycle in order to get to the point of higher quality data and so some of the things that we certainly see in, in various countries is the importance of ensuring that there's a stable leg legislative and policy environment which then will underpin any kind of open data initiatives which take place and then also ensure that to address the question of momentum that is not just a once-off um, disclosure of data but that is actually embedded into a legal a legal system which then allows the society and other actors to then rely on that should government not um, maintain its commitments there. There's also something to be said around what, what, what we are big about to say how do you think politically about data and how do you ensure that the political will around data is retained 
outside of a crisis or emergency or perhaps a response to a scandal or leaks. And so that part, part of thinking about data in, in context and so the context of, of, of legislation in the context of a legal framework and the context of a political system is as important as ultimately getting good quality data out. The other aspect, I suppose, is that part of what open ownership is doing or, or, or positions as a theory of change is to say that we are wanting to drive the momentum for adoption of a particular type of data, so beneficial ownership data. But as more countries, and, and this is what we're seeing, as more countries make the commitment and to improve the quality of their data, it's just from just being a growth momentum to becoming a norm. And I think that's what we want to see as more countries begin to say, well, this is just a normal part of governance or a normal part of what information is required for a variety of reasons. Then it changes from being an advocacy or a, it just a nice to have to a, but this is just a natural part of what needs to be in place in order for society to function effectively and for beneficial data in order for procurement officials or, um, law enforcement agencies of the society to be able to do their job effectively and, and have the kind of transformative impact they are looking for. Yeah, so a, a few of the questions that, that we've had um, from the audience have also talked about, you know, the quality of data. It's not just, is there data? Is it good quality data? Is it in a standard format um, and not just in open data format, but is it you know, uh, against a certain standard, um, like open contracting data, for instance. Um, and that's half the challenge as well, I suppose. It's not that is the data out there, is it easily um, usable um, to, to actually be able to achieve anything with it or to cross compare or anything like that. So data standards are very important as well. Um, and Olivia, I think you actually, you, you raised this a little bit earlier, that it's not just about data, it's about having a good standard that, that is global. How do, we, how do we make sure that that's what the aim is and not just, oh, well, technically we published it even though it's in a PDF. Um, yes, that is, that, that is a really, really, it's, there are different layers to this. Um, and I completely agree with the fact that uh, lack of interoperability and lack of standards are, uh, are a barrier, if not to the access to this data, but to use usability of the data and data that is being uh, published in completely non-standards way are, are barriers in, in themselves and they're, and they're only the job half done. Um, I think the pandemic has been a really, really uh, complicating factor in that usually, and um, some of my background is in is in um, uh, technological standards and standards take time. You need, because a standard is an agreement with a lot of people present, otherwise it's not a standard. You can't just say, here's a thing, it's a standard. It needs to, to, be, to, to be developed. Now there are technical standards like you know, uh, for formats, for instance, that can be adopted and they ought to be adopted whenever um, making data available. But when it comes to the vocabularies, the identifiers, all those uh, more specific elements of how we structure and, uh, and make data available, if you need new vocabularies, um, so I'll give an example. Um, there, there has been hundreds of symptom tracking applications and studies at the beginning and since uh, the beginning of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And, you know, symptom tracking is not a new thing. There's, there's, there, there is precedent there. But um, one of the questions that uh, early on was, if you're, if you're symptom tracking, what is your dictionary of symptoms? Well, how do you define those symptoms so that uh, if you are getting data from one symptom tracker to an, and, and data from another symptom tracker, which a lot of um, research institutes uh, were doing, that it's actually interoperable. And the reality of it is you do not have the time to get all the symptom trackers around the table and to figure out how they're going to agree on a thing to use. And so in this case, the the, the, the interoperability needs to remain the goal and the, the adoption of existing standards needs to be the basics uh, of, of the definition. But in some cases, there needs to be other bits of the infrastructure that 
bridge the gap between the existing and the um, and the need for standards that that do, you do not have the time to develop, and that's where another part of the open um, infrastructure uh, happens is that if you if you are building a a set of software that will um, uh, work with data across a spectrum of uh, varied formats, for instance, Ma making that software uh, available openly means that other are going to be able to use that, that dis those disparate sources of data. And so, well, you know, the, the banging the drum of, of standards as one way to, to overcome these barriers is an important one. What I, would, what I would really stress is saying, oh yeah, we need standards, therefore let's drop everything and build a standard and we'll get back to you when we've got a standard. That's not uh, applicable in this case like this. And therefore a mix of build, using the standards that exist, but also opening the bits of your pipeline as much as possible if you are using some of this data, it will bridge the gap and it will, and it will uh, help overcome that barrier. Thank you. And and so civil society is obviously a big part of, of you know, the open data community and, and the people that have a lot of expertise in um, in this area. So Fabrizio, you, and you've actually said um, that it's very important for civil society to be able to get um, their eyes on this, um, not just civil society organizations, probably like a lot of us on this call, but um, the press and, you know, wider civil society journalists um, as well, um, but again, there's a there's a political element to that that is a bit difficult. Not only in terms of who gets access and how it's presented, but who then actually has the expertise to understand that the data they are presented with. Then, yes, uh, I mean there is uh, an issue in terms of how civil society in general, at least in the, in the experience I'm, I'm grounded here in, in Latin America, get access to data. And in a pandemic context, context that, that has been troublesome. Uh, as, um, you know, it is the case, for instance, for, um, for data on contracts and budget, which is usually, you know, in times of emergency, governments do have uh, the powers to um, speed up contracting procedures. Um, and in, in doing so, um, well, sometimes they might not publish all the related data about those procedures. And as a result, governments become more vulnerable to overprice or to several market practices that are not okay. Um, and, and some uh, colleagues here at the Red Palta, which is a, a network of journalists across Latin America, has been doing that work uh, and trying to, um, to spot these trends uh, to, some, to, to some success, right? Then they all question arises, whether the publication of those reports or that analysis delivers accountability. And that's a wider uh, question, which strictly depends on how strong are your accountability institutions in your country, um, just as a spoiler of the whole literature in this field. <laughs> um, but then, then the question remains, though, that uh, the fact that we are able to know this is a good sign. Uh, and the fact that we do have civil society equipped to analyze this is a good sign. Um, but that capacity is uh, relatively low. Um, and as I think someone was pointing out in the chat that um, there seems to be a lot of software there, but not people able to, to analyze it. And, and that is the fact that we still need to invest more in you know, building uh, capacity, not only in civil society, but probably in a, in a more general trend across society, but certainly, you know, newsrooms, uh, small NGOs are a great way to test this, to build the equip, equipment, to equip people with, with the skills to run proper data analysis. And, and as a result, um, that actually leads to several avenues on computational thinking and so on. And, but at the end of the day, um, I think that's something we might need to invest more. Um, and that's something that if the trend continues, uh, we definitely need to to upgrade these um, these capacities uh, across across civil society. Not only for if you want um, organizations such as my society or ILDA or the ODI and others that were born out of the digital era, but actually people that you know are doing the contact tracing in Uruguay, which at the end of the day they they were born with you know pen paper and as the best of luck, a central database where they're able to keep these names and addresses in place, which is so far to, to, to what the available evidence uh, 
I have in this country, the only successful way of containing this virus, right? Because at the moment, that's, that's so far what has been successful uh, to keep this going. And that's done by a, bunch, uh, by a bunch of doctors, pen, paper, and, you know, maybe uh, the support of other technological um, elements, uh, but it's not more sophisticated than that. So, so I also I think that when reflecting about the pandemic, uh, we might need to be a bit, a bit more humble about what data can deliver and what cannot deliver. Um, and, and so that's, that's also important because the other gap I found in this pandemic is the gap between the people at, in the front line, in the trenches, mostly in the health sector, and the people doing this fantastic analysis in, you know, in a statistical complex model and armchair epidemiologists across Twitter and all these people say like, yeah, somehow that doesn't add up, you know, and I think that some of these models might be, you know, having wild assumptions in there. Uh, but be just because you have access to a statistical software and a bunch of who knows how was created data sets uh, doesn't give you the right to, you know, um, extrapolate uh, decisions that could influence for worst uh, what, what, uh, what we are trying to achieve here, which is to control this pandemic. So, so that's complex. Uh, and I'm a bit annoyed about that because we have seen a lot of that in Uruguay. Um, but, but also because I think that it's going to be something we, we need to come to terms uh, about the limits of how our data is created, uh, who is in the process of developing these standards. And this is not in the context of the pandemic, my colleague Silvana Fumega and others uh, wrote recently a, a, a blog post on a reflection on how standards and the community developing them, uh, you know, might exclude certain voices. We had some experience developing a prototype on a standard on femicides in Latin America, um, which is the, un the unheard pandemic so far, right? Like we are getting to see, uh, and we cannot document properly um, violence against women in this region. So as a result, you know, the standards are very, very important because not only, even if it's a prototype, they allow us to capture uh, things that the reality is not, uh, is not uh, that we are, we are yet unable to assess. But, but on the point of civil society, I, I, I think that, that, that we need to, to get better at equip, equipping a lot more civil society organization and newsroom um, with, with, with uh, basic data skills so they can engage uh, further and act as, as a spare head for demand. Absolutely. And there's obviously the question, I think, uh, again, I think some people in the sidebar have been uh, raising this, that it's, it's a political choice what data gets released as well. Um, on the one hand, there could be some really great data in, in really great open formats released by government, but it's a political decision a lot of the time at the moment to release that data. And there are, you know, being cynical here, some governments around the world that are using the pandemic as an opportunity to not release certain information, um, whether that is in data format or whether that's in the form of just general information. Um, here in the UK, you know, our information commissioner is not um, telling people off, telling public bodies off uh, for not disclosing information within a timely matter at the moment. So there's, there's there's issues there i mean uh olivier what are you what do you think is the way forward here in terms of pushing for the right data and as fabrizio said in terms of getting you know good education the right skills the right people to be actually analyzing this information and getting it then in front of normal people um the <clears throat> it's complex i mean that's your you know the, the question you're asking is pretty much the whole mission of the odi so work with us you know uh, but uh, uh, a less flippant answer is i think there are essentially three big things that we need to keep pushing for one and fabrizio really talked about that quite well that skills is an important bit although i would uh, i would mention that we need skills across the board we need we need we do need people a, able to work with data but we also need people who need to understand the value of data we need to people to understand the impact of data so th things like getting decision makers to understand what data is what what data can be used for is is an equally important skill in order Order for um, for the demand and, and the supply to to, to be adequate. Um, the second um, 
The second one uh, thing that I, that I would mention, and and, uh, and and I'll echo something that was mentioned in the comments, is that we we need to uh, empower organizations and whether it's um, local government departments, but also uh, other organizations, non-governmental organizations, to um, to be part of that effort to. Uh, publish and make data available. If you wait for central governments to have the right motivation, the right skills, the right infrastructure, the right timing, the right message, and all of that, uh, you you put it's it's yeah you put literally all your eggs in that one basket whereas we've seen especially in this pandemic that there are specific questions for uh for local governments to to answer and giving them the ability to um uh, to collect and share and open this data them, themselves, giving them the the infrastructure, technical, the skills uh, to do that, means that you don't have to wait on the political will in the, in central or federal governments to make that happen. And uh, very briefly, the last point that I think is really really important to keep in mind is that we need to get a much much more nuanced uh, view of risk. So long, and that, that echoes something that Fabrizio said, I think, uh, much earlier on in our conversation, that, that notion that, oh, if it's risky, we'll, we're not going to do it. Risk is not a binary thing. If we get people to understand that risk is something for data as well as for everything else is something that you manage, is something that's on a spectrum and that you can mitigate risk by uh, with data, for instance, through processes of, of anonymization. Uh, uh, you know, we've got, we've got a statistical uh, agencies that uh, that publish data that are about us on a regular basis, and they have got the right uh, the right skills, the right frameworks to to make sure that that data is safe when it's published. And so, understanding that data can be modified, uh, can be processed in in ways to make it safe, means that we can have a much more nuanced and useful discussion on risk rather than oh no we're not we're not opening this data because it's sensitive or because it's private that is that that is unhelpful and that is thinking that data cannot be changed or 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 processed when when it can thank you um yeah so we are running quickly running out of time so i'm actually going to just ask a maybe final question here unless anyone's got some quick last minute ones to put in the sidebar um, Carabo, is open ownership, um, firstly, I, I'm going to do a two-part question here, firstly, is there any one example of how data is being collected or used um, during the pandemic that you think is worthy of note and, and that people here would be interested in hearing about? And I suppose, secondly, what are your ambitions um, for the future in terms of, you know, asking things of the South African government or asking things of the international community in, in relation to kind of open data? Yeah, both great questions and big questions. So in relation to demonstrations of how data has been used, um, particularly under COVID-19. We've got a couple of good examples where there are already existing public registers of beneficial ownership. And so in the case of Slovakia, there's a particular um, set of SMEs who were linked to where there was a conflict of, ident conflict of interest identified, which was, uh, which was picked up by civil society. And so in that instance, that potential risk was identified quickly. The opportunity that I think open ownership does offer is that because it's a relatively new policy and data area, it does allow for this idea of a multi-stakeholder process to set up a, a system or to set up what will ultimately be a public register or a, a sectoral register. When I don't know whether it was Fabricio or Olivia were talking about the importance of standards, I think that's a huge that, that that's a huge um, element of what open ownership is trying to do. So by use of the beneficial ownership data standard, countries have got some kind of mechanism needs to be put in on the data side to make sure that the policy or other objectives are addressed in what ultimately the register looks like. Something else that our tech team has done, which has been very useful for 
the useful for data users, and, and this has been from government implementers in particular, is creating a data visualization tool. And so what we often hear from an FIU or another um, government implementer is that com company ownership is extremely complex. We've got this huge database of information about company ownership structure, but we want to understand the relationships. And so by creating a visualizer tool, which Open Ownership has done through the tech team, it allows uh, an implementer or civil society to be able to then actually see through in a visual form or hear all the relationships and be able to then identify whether there's anything which is of interest or anything that can be explored further. So if open ownership, what we will be doing going forward is 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 looking to support countries when there's a particular interest in visual ownership and procurement in South Africa, Mexico, and, and Indonesia, but then also maintaining the, the scope of our work, which is to support all countries who are moving to implement their commitments around beneficial ownership transparency. Thank you. Uh, Fabrizio, over to you, same question. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, like the, the issue around standards is that um i think i would echo olivier in the previous in the previous uh, question that we need a range of skills and people and not all are around the same part of of, uh, of the chain right so we have people um you definitely we need more awareness and connecting these people together and this is applied to any silos or to any uh, domain basically and and doing that is difficult and and because we are also in a time in where we are um, muddling through different generations of um, people, different generations of organizations and and quite frank and different and differences in terms of power access and, and location. This is the nature of our world it's not the same to fight this pandemic you know in in a, in a, a coast town in Uruguay than to do so in La Paz Bolivia or to do so from the center of London. It's just not the same thing. Uh, we don't have the same resources. And as a result, uh, we might need to be, um, to be um, you know, very uh, uh, eclectic in how we tackle this challenge as a one good or one off solution for everyone might not work. I think to some degree, this applies to standards, um, but, um, and echoing uh, echoing Olivier as well, I think that uh, there is something to to be said about how to to weave these these communities in the in the long run. Uh, in the short run, though, uh, I think that we need to essentially be much much better and 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 uh, in terms of processing, analyzing, and and, and feeding this to to the decision makers, uh, particularly to guide the the crucial decisions that we are going to get to see in the next uh, eighteen months or so. Uh, and also to guard against, uh, let's say, uh, misuses of emergency powers uh, that we get to see across, at least across Latin America. Um, because this can have long lasting impacts uh, at the moment. This is a strange situation, a weird situation, a one-off if you want that probably, hopefully, we all get to experience in, in our lifetime. Um, but that will have effect, uh, and and I think it's the time for people working on using data for for um, to monitor this development, uh, to also remain vigilant about not only you know the use to solve the pandemic, but also what doesn't get noticed because we are all, if you want, embedded in this pandemic climate. So so it's it's tough times. Uh, and 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 I echo what you said um, about you know this kind of knee-jerk responses about yes it's all about COVID now. Um, in a way, it is because yes, it's you know it's a we need to recover from this, but the way we do that might need to you know to find us in a better position of where we started, right? And for that, transparency, accountability, use of evidence remains very very central to this agenda. If we are yet to live in democracies that value evidence and rational discourse uh, overall, and that, that's that's also up for debate, but I would like to live in one of those. <laughs> Thanks, Fabrizio. Olivier, um, if you could keep it super brief, we've no, we're running 
dangerously low on time here. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll I'll leave you with one with one thought then that um, we need to reconcile the two things that are that seem at odds with one another. One which is to uh, know that data, if made open or shared, can have uses that aren't uh, necessarily understood. But at the same time that th we tend to create better value because it's more appropriate when we start from the problem. And I think COVID has shown us that, that if we start from a challenge, if we get the people together around that, then we can make the case for data being, being, uh, being part of that solution. We can make the case for data to be collected. And by the way, not just by governments, but collected, put together, made open and used openly. And I think if we manage to keep the two together, the, a desire for openness as a, as, a, as a baseline, but also an understanding to not always start from the data, but start from the challenges, then we have a, we have a chance to, uh, to to, to build something better. Fabulous, thank you, Olivia. Very concise. Try to. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry to say we've run out of time. Um, that hour flew by. Um, it was really, really interesting, and I'm extremely grateful for Fabrizio Carabo and Olivier for, for joining us. Um, I'm sure everyone had a lot more questions. I'm sorry I didn't uh, have time to ask. Uh, but, you know, keep the conversation going on Twitter if you fancy it. Um, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Gemma and Mark now who are going to do their wizardry thing and get everyone into the networking session. But that's that's it from me. So thank you very, very much for joining us. And I hope everyone stays safe as the pandemic progresses. <laughs>